Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, wherever you happen to be. And welcome to this webinar. Thank you, Christian. So I'm delighted to tell you about Ancient Mesoamerica. We publish the archaeology of Mesoamerica, the art history, ethno history, and historical archaeology. And I would particularly like to invite new scholars because we welcome your contributions. And I would like to demystify the publication process for you. Even before you start writing an article, what you should do is look at published articles that you think are excellent and deconstruct them. One of the most valuable classes that I took in graduate school was the philosophy of science. And we had to deconstruct articles and that was valuable. You should also get feedback from your peers, advisor, mentors before submitting a manuscript and ask them to comment on it using the same kinds of review criteria that we use on our website. So that is one thing that you can do. And in terms of the process, I have a slide here that will uh, speak to that. So if you look at this uh, slide with lots of things on it, demystifying the publication process, in round one, you, the author, will upload your manuscript to Scholar One, S1 is Scholar One, it goes to the managing editor who is excellent. Dr. Uh, I should say Mr. Bruce Brushy is uh, always on top of things, replies to emails immediately in terms of helping you if you have any issues at all, but most people don't. Then the managing editor ensures that all of the different parts are there, that the manuscript is anonymized, and then it goes to the editor in chief or the co-editor. I look over it and I determine to which editor it goes. So for example, if there was a manuscript on um, central Mexico, this would go to Blanca. If there was a manuscript on the classic Maya, then I would handle it as the editor. Then we review it, um, the manuscript itself, determine what peers would be appropriate for reviewing this particular manuscript. The peer reviews come in, you've got three weeks to do a review. And also, if you're interested in doing reviews for the journal, please let me know. Um, the editor looks over the reviews, makes a decision, and then it goes to the author. And the author will once again upload to Scholar One, depending on um, whether accepted with major revisions or accepted with minor revisions. If you have only minor revisions, then once again, you upload your manuscript, it goes to the managing editor, to me, and then the editor approves. It, your manuscript goes to production. Uh, production contacts the author in terms of figures, ensuring that all the images are up to the standards. It goes to me for proofreading. And then your manuscript goes back to production and you will see it online in first view. If you do need major revisions, which is very common to have more than one round of reviews, once again, you upload the manuscript to Scholar One. Bruce, the managing editor, looks over it. It goes to me, I assign the editor. The editor assigns the peer reviews. And then the editor makes the decision based on the reviews of the peer and also the editor's input and the author is notified. So this is a process, as I said, it's not like you simply upload a manuscript and then uh, boom, a couple weeks later you're published. This involves a lot of people and a lot of decision-making all along the way. Okay, so if I could uh, get out of this stop share. Okay, so if you have any questions anytime about that publication process, I'm happy to answer that for you. So I will hand it over to someone else at this point. Well, thank you, Nan. I was just about to um, to also say that um, I omitted to introduce Kenneth as well. Kenneth Hurt, who we have on the, um, the panel today. Um, so big apologies there, Kenneth. 
Um, I just want to let everybody know that he's Professor of Anthropology at Pennsylvania State University. Um, and we are delighted to have him with us as well today. Um, maybe uh, based on that, Ken, you might like to, to possibly jump in um, and support any of the points that Nan just made. Um, sure, just um, uh, to follow up what um, Nan has just said, uh, you might question why, when there are so many sources on the web, as well as in books and journals on how to write a successful article, is there a need for a webinar on the subject? Well, our response here is that journals have their house styles, not just of writing, but also of the type of articles that they seek to publish. In other words, there is a case for saying that offering guidance on securing publication in a specific journal needs itself to be bespoke. Um, a key starting point in the lesson, which um, even established scholars need reminding of, is don't write the article first and then look for a journal to which to submit it. Start with choosing the journal most appropriate for the, for the proposed article. Um, a further basic point is, if you're interested in publishing in ancient Mesoamerica, first familiarize yourself with the journal. Visit the website to gain appreciation of the, the journal's mission statement and troll recent volumes of the journal to gain an understanding of the types of articles published and their quality. Troll should give you the benefit of highlighting articles in the same broad subject area as your own. Um, how the issue was written up successfully, what new debates were opened up, and possibly also the gaps in the literature to which your own contribution can respond. And well, from here, I'd like to um, pass it on to um, our uh, panelists here that they have, um, all of them have uh, experience both with publishing and with publishing in, in, in ancient Mesoamerica. Yes, Christina, Deborah, or Kenneth, if you want to um, tell us about your experience of the journal, um, your thoughts on the journal, its, its relevance, its importance. And as Blanca said, you all have a long history with it. So, so please tell us a little bit more about your involvement. Deborah, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, I, my first comment is to encourage everyone that nothing gets published if you don't start. Um, so the article that you never send to anyone and that you never share um, won't get in print. And, and to understand, particularly for those of you who are, who are starting out, it's a daunting, it's, it feels like a daunting process. But what you see published is the result of, of, of a process um, in which you get feedback from external reviewers and from editors. It doesn't always look as polished when the article is first submitted as what it looks like when it's on the final pages of the journal. Um, and, 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 and research is not necessarily perfection. And I think particularly, again, when you're starting out, if you think that you don't have every sentence right, every table correct, um, and in fact, the feedback process and the review process is, I see it as really essential to research. It makes my research better. It makes me explain it better. Um, it challenges me to think about alternative explanations for the data that I found. So really see it as part of the research, research process, um, not just a hurdle to get over, but really part of what you're doing to share your research and get feedback on it. Um, and, 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 and I want to encourage that. Um, one of the things that I really like about ancient Mesoamerica, and, and is a reason that I've, I've, I've published with it frequently, is one, the format of the, of the journal, which I think really supports illustrative material more so than some other publications do um, in print as well as online. Um, that is one piece. And the other, and I think Christina will speak to this as well, is that I've published individual articles, but the special sections have really been an important vehicle for me because most of my research has been collaborative. Um, I'm at a relatively small institution. I work with archeologists in Mexico and archeologists in different laboratories. And this is really, and the journal provides an opportunity to pull together the threads of a project. 
And I, I want to encourage you, um, a special section is a challenge. It's a lot more work than a single authored article is. The articles really need to be integrated. And I always start first by looking at the journal, but I also start by being in touch with the, with the editors of the journal and, and laying out my initial idea for a special section, what the different topics would be and the different articles and authors and seeing um, what their reaction is and what feedback they even initially have to give me um, before I start to pull, pull, it, pull it together. And I wanna give Christina a chance to jump in here because she's just recently done one. So just in terms of special sections, uh, I'd like to say that um, there's several advantages with publishing a special section with ancient Mesoamerica. Um, usually when you have a particular research topic in which you have a number of different collaborations and papers that are organized under the same theme, it's uh, obviously very common to publish um, as an edited volume for a press. But what the special section in Ancient Mesoamerica does is it kind of streamlines this process and it allows you to get your work out much quicker. So if you compare, for example, in the last special section in which I organized from start to finish, from the beginning in which I submitted the proposal to the editors to the point of publication, it was a year and a half. So that was, that was really great for me um, because a comparative for an edited volume um, would be about two to three years. So by that time, the, the work is a little bit more dated um, and you know, young scholars and you know, emerging scholars need to get their work out sometimes quicker than others. And so that provides a, a nice advantage. Um, and also just to reiterate what Deb said is that there's no um, limit to figures and the figure quality is very high. So in um, other journals, there's a figure limit, sometimes eight figures, which really isn't enough it's, if it's a very visual article. Um, uh, and then the other flexibility for special sections is that there's always an option to for the contributors to publish outside of the special section. For example, in the special section in which I organized, um, I had to limit the number of scholars that um, could be a part of it. But one of the problems is that the, the, the deadlines, not everyone can make the deadlines. So having it as part of ancient Mesoamerica, you can offer, well, you could always submit it outside of the special set section as part of an individual article in, in ancient Mesoamerica. And that kind of allows for the organizers to get the deadlines down pat and to, you know, to make a workable special section together. Ken, do you have anything that you wanted to add? Sure, just, just in general, <clears throat> whether you know, an author is writing for a special section or for you know, just a, an article that's submitted to the journal, I think everybody needs to keep in mind that it's all about clear communication. Uh, and that starts with clearly identifying what the problem is, and then very quickly telling the audience why it's important. Uh, that way, you know, whether somebody is a lionist or works in North, uh, you know, Northern Mexico or wherever can identify with, with what the issue is and, and, and how it relates to their area, uh, even if it's, you know, slightly uh, in a different geographical region, uh, and so those two things, those two points, I think are, are, you know, are really important to begin with, and then uh, make sure that the organization clearly explains how the data was collected, what was the method, and, and sort of the assumptions that are made uh, in the interpretations. I think if if authors will think of themselves slightly as uh, storytellers to make the writing as clear and simple as possible, the ideas will come across much more clearly because one of the, the things that usually authors get back uh, from reviewers is to unpack some of the ideas that they have because no matter how clear they may be to the author, if they don't come across clearly to the reader, who maybe is only paying 80% to the article, you know, attention, uh, you know, it, uh, it needs to be, uh, expressed clearly. And then just one additional point on what uh, Deb said at the beginning. Uh, back in the day when we used to submit things in paper, uh, I taught a seminar on publication and the most difficult hurdle uh, that everybody faced 
It's putting it in the mail. Now it's hitting the submit button. You know, so uh, you know that that is probably the biggest hurdle. Uh, but you know, you don't have to worry. The reviewers will help point out where strengths need to be built into an argument. Thanks, Ken. Um, and in terms of, I wonder, you know, if we we sort of talking about starting points. Um, maybe this is in fact an end point, but how important do we think the actual title of the article um, in terms of reflecting content um, and so on. So Nan, I don't know if you want to take that one. There we go. So one thing about the title that you should consider is it should effectively convey and excite people about reading what you are writing. And in these days, the other thing you have to keep in mind about the title is that there are lots of search engines out there that pick up different things in a title. So for example, if your paper is on the Mexica and you don't have that in your title, then that's not gonna be picked up in the search engine. So there are a number of things to consider in the title. And once again, the peer review will help you refine the title as well as the editor and the copy editor process. So if you have a great title, um, that's actually a really good starting point. Yeah, because sometimes, you know, there's that sort of um, other approach, isn't there, where the title is, is decided at the very end sometimes, but um, do you have um, any thoughts also on um, originality of papers and, and providing a completely brand new perspective? How important is that? It's extremely important because Ancient Mesoamerica does not publish material that has already been published 10 times over. We want to highlight the latest things that you have done in terms of data and also your insights about a particular topic or area. So originality is extremely important. And do, um, do you have any kind of um, examples of sort of titles or articles that were recently published that, that kind of speak to that, that, that um, people can see um, tick all of those boxes. Is there anything off the top of your head that you can think of? There is. If you go to the Ancient Mesoamerica website, you can click on um, a little tab that tells you what is the most popular article at the time or from the most recent issue, which was the most downloaded. And there is one, for example, on an Aztec god. And that was extremely popular because of the title and also because of the new insights that the author had about that particular topic. So I advise uh, especially the new scholars or if you haven't published in ancient Mesoamerica for a while to explore the ancient Mesoamerica website. There are actually lots of resources on there to help you and there's lots of insights about the journal there as well. And how important is it also, um, I sort of throw this question out to the whole panel as well, um, for scholars to make connections to relevant theoretical, conceptual, um, methodological debates, um, you know, sort of when, when creating and submitting their work. Deborah, do you have any thoughts on that? Yes, and I think it goes back to a, a point that Ken was also making, and that is, what will draw people to your research and be interested in it? And we all on the one hand work in a kind of small circle in a, in a place in a particular time period very often or on a particular research question. Um, and yet it, it's embedded in probably a larger context. And, and I, I think in, in that regard, you can draw people into your research, for example, a Mayanist, 
um, who might read something about work being done on the Aztecs because it, 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 it relates to issues of markets, say, for example, a favorite topic of, of Ken Hurst, um, um, or, or uh, vice versa, people in the highlands looking to see how the very methodological advances my colleagues in the Maya lowlands have made in detecting marketplaces, which honestly we've not done as well um, in, in highland areas. And, and that can be, oh, you know, that can be another way of drawing a larger circle people of people into reading your research. And it then makes you also think about addressing it to a larger audience. You know, I would say, and this applies to myself as well, that when I start writing, I sometimes start in that hole and then I realize I need to, to, to recognize how my work relates to larger methodological and theoretical um, issues. And, and then what I've done that, um, the article, gets more traction and more people read it and I get more of other kinds of feedback. And I fully admit there are some people, Liz Brumfield was incredibly good about clever titles for articles. Like why didn't I think of Weechley Poachley's Conquest? Um, uh, oh, you know, or you know, or please pass the tamales. Or um, some people are really good at it. Some of us are, and I include myself here, a little bit more stodgy with it. But the the title can also be a way of you thinking about that larger audience that you want to address. And I think as a younger scholar, that was one of the things um, that I needed to remind myself. Um, who are the other people I would like to see read and be engaged with this research? Um, and that, that initial framing in the beginning of your article can really help that. Um, and, and so that you're just not writing to the five other people who are interested in Aztec three um, pottery and, and how it was made. Um, but Aztec three pottery as a way of looking at a commodity or Aztec three pottery is a way of encoding symbolic rituals on the ceramics or about expressing gender relationships. That draws a much larger audience and allows you to take your work and address it to those bigger theoretical and methodological questions. Um, remember the thing that you did may, might very well be innovative for somebody else working in another part of ancient Mesoamerica. Great. If I can, if I can make a, a comment, oh. if I can make a comment to build on that. I think theoretical relevance is very important, um, you know, for these, for any, uh, you know, for any article that's being written, but, uh, you know, authors should also strive to be scholarly. And scholarly means not just citing literature in the last five years. Uh, you know, we, we publish in ancient Mesoamerica in both English and Spanish, not just with English articles, with Spanish abstracts. And one of the things that North American scholars have been notoriously bad at, and this goes back before my generation, is not to read the Spanish literature. You know, we have a whole array of colleagues in Mexico and Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador, and beyond uh, who publish extensively. And I can guarantee all of you, they know the material culture record and the prehistoric record better than most all of us because they live it, they work with it every day. So I would just encourage, especially young scholars uh, to search out and read of the, the Spanish literature and incorporate that into their, in their discussions. Uh, so, you know, current contemporary theory is important, but scholarship uh, also asks you to know the historic roots, you know, of an argument and also know uh, what uh, scholars on both sides of multiple borders uh, are engaged in. Is, is that something that we think um, is sometimes then very much missed when submitting articles to, to this journal? Well, if, if you do a, you know, I don't want to make a judgment because, you know, Nan and Blanca are, you know, dealing with all the current articles, but an easy way to evaluate that would be to go through the bibliographies of uh, non-Spanish speaking, uh, native Spanish speakers and see how many uh, Spanish citations are in the bibli bibliography. I've done that looking at a couple of, of recent uh, ancient Mesoamerica, uh, you know, volumes, and I won't share 
how low a percentage you know that that turns out to be. We can all do better. You know, we can all do better on that. Uh, and part of it, you know, is just communicating. You know, just communicating communicating with our our American, our Canadian, our Latin American collaborators and fellow archaeologists. Is it is it in that case? Is it possible? Um both on that point and in general um, for authors or anyone considering a submission to, to get in touch with the journal, to ask for guidance or in, you know, ab about that specific point, or indeed if the article or research subject is even suitable for ancient Mesoamerica, is that something that people can do in advance? It is, and there are um, authors who have contacted me and asked, would this be acceptable for the journal? In some cases it is, and I encourage them. And in other cases, perhaps the um, message that they are conveying deserves an even broader publication. And in one case, I suggested that they actually um, would go to American anthropologists instead because of the very broad message. It wasn't really just about something in Mesoamerica. It was more anthropological in nature. And certainly our articles are anthropological in nature, but in terms of the very large message that they wanted to convey. And uh, to follow up on the special sections, if I may, I would like to add that as a coordinator of a special section, this is a good option for um, newer scholars, younger scholars, particularly if you are in a vulnerable position, perhaps as a graduate student finishing up your career or an assistant professor, because you are then in a situation unlike uh, being the editor of an edited volume where the peer reviews are coming from outside and the editor is the one, uh, the journal editor is the one saying, hey, um, you need to get in your revisions rather than the um, coordinator of the special section. So it takes some of the political situations off of the coordinator and it puts them onto me or Blanca instead. So that is an advantage of doing a special section from that viewpoint. I remember as a graduate student, I tried to do a co-edited volume and it, it just fell apart because of the political situation. And I was actually quite relieved that it did. And I ended up publishing some of that material elsewhere as did the authors. So there is one situation where I have a graduate student who wanted to do uh, a co-edited volume with me actually. And I said, no, I think that instead you should be the coordinator and it also gives that person greater recognition, especially if that's important for tenure decisions, for example. And I'm sure uh, the rest of you can speak to that situation in terms of tenure and the importance of publishing in our journal. Yeah, that's a great point, Christina. Deborah, does it does it speak to your experience? Yes, and I, I wanted to add something, having been on a university tenure and promotion committees, as well as writing letters, and that is um, an edited book volume may have two outside reviewers. The journal articles, each article may have four or five or six reviewers. So the review process is more rigorous, I'll be perfectly frank, for journals very often. and and, and that actually, I think, matters. Um, it, it's, it's a valuable experience um, for you. It, it, it matters when in the tenure and, and, and the tenure review process. I think it's generally seen as a more rigorous. And the other thing, and something that Nan also alluded to as well, and that is when you're the coordinator of a number of articles, um, some of your authors may be more responsive to suggestions from you, um, but they will be expected by the journal editor to respond to the reviewer's comments. And that can help us, I think, also be helpful for you for working with the authors in, in a special section to help them improve um, their, their 
individual articles and contributions because they are going to be expected to respond to those individual reviewers and that review process independently with, that go with each article going through it, which is very different than the chapters in an edited volume. And that can be a really big help for you. Yeah, and uh, in terms of tenure and review, the, the work put in as a coordinator is recognized and there are the fact that you are organizing a body of work and submitting an introduction that, that puts it all together, that that work is or, you know, recognized um, by the higher ups. Um, but just to reiterate both what um, Deb and Nan mentioned in terms of not having to deal with some of the politics, um, it's, you know, there, there are quite a bit of advantages of not having to say, okay, this particular contribution is, is is weak and we it can't be a part of the contribution that that doesn't get decided by the organizers the coordinators it gets decided by the peer reviewers and so that puts a little bit of weight off of what are personal relationships that you have with colleagues so that then that's particularly helpful um, if you're just starting out and then what i also mentioned in terms of you know one of the hardest things of organizing an edited volume is having the contributors respect the deadlines. And you always have someone that, you know, needs six more months or another year, and that's not fair to the other contributors who need to get their work out. And so if they can't make it, then they can't make it. That's okay. They, the, the special section will go ahead. Thank you, Christina. I, we talked some, uh, a fair amount about the title and the the organization of uh, that, that goes into submitting an article um, and I suppose as part of that um, you know we need to consider what makes also for a really enticing abstract um, I think we've covered off lots of the points around um, being precise being concise being accurate and so on but do you have does anyone have any sort of really almost foolproof tips on how to write um, the perfect abstract I would I would say you need to write the abstract last. Don't write it first. You know, make a good introduction, lay out your argument, and then come back and summarize it. A lot of times, articles attempt to use the abstract as an introduction. You know, and by the time you get to the introduction, you know, you already can tell it. You know, it it's not working particularly well. So the, my best advice for you know for writing the abstract is, you know. Write the whole article, make sure your introduction's clear, communication goals, et cetera, are clear. Then come back and really summarize it, you know, and, and uh, talk about it, what, what is, what's important. And one of the things that I hate when I read an abstract is when someone says, this is what I'm going to do, rather than these are the results. This is what I found. Because the person who's reading it wants kind of the big summary. Okay, what did you get out of the study? Yes, the background, but what did you get out of the study in a very succinct way rather than I'm going to do this. Well, I wanna know what <laughs> did you do? Yeah. The other thing about the abstract is that once again, search engines will pick up certain words from the abstract. So these key results that Christina is talking about should be there. And it's okay if you think that, oh, well, I, I don't want to, you know, kind of give away the punchline. Well, you need to tell us why we want to read your article and what is in it and what are those results. Yeah, absolutely. Um... And then a little bit further along in the process, and I'm conscious of time as well, we want to get to some of our um, attendees' questions, but um, could you tell us a little bit about, you touched on it very briefly earlier on, but a little bit about the peer review process and how that really works? Uh, Blanco, do you wanna speak to that? Yeah, I think it, um, I'll leave you to, to answer that. I've been here since January only, so I think you can leave Okay, the fair enough, I apologize. So the peer review process, when you submit your manuscript, you have the option to suggest peers. And granted, we don't want you suggesting all of your close friends who have already given the thumbs up and that this is a great article and is just going to pass it through. Okay, that's not the 
um, that's not the role of the peer review suggestions. So you do have options for suggesting what peers will review. And what I like to think of for peer review is, who is the, the last person you would wanna review your article? You should think of that ahead of time and actually get feedback from that person even before you submit that article. So if that is the most critical person you can think of in terms of input, then that's a big help for your own success. So the peers are carefully chosen. What I do is I look at the overall content of the article and who is an expert in this field or who has done recent research. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a full professor to do a peer review. Sometimes I find that the newer scholars, the younger scholars, have more insights about some more recent things going on than me, for example. Um, I've published for some time now and I'm a full professor and I might not be as in touch with some of the newest insights in terms of uh, that particular specialty. So I also look at who is referenced, uh, who is in the bibliography of the article and I like to choose a variety of people with different backgrounds in terms of the diversity of the peer reviewers also. Uh, not just everybody from the USA, for example, I like to get a broader range of reviewers. And then the peer reviews are sent, the peer review requests are sent to three people at a minimum and sometimes as many as five people. If I get reviews back and one says reject, one says accept, and one says minor revisions, then that to me says that there are, are diverse viewpoints here, everything from this is a great article to don't publish this. And then I need to get a couple of more peer reviews and weigh in on this myself as I do with every single article. Thanks, Nan. I'm and just before we, we sort of kick in with our, our Q&A from the attendees um, who've joined us this evening, I wondered if I could potentially put everybody just very slightly on the spot and ask you all maybe to give me the single most important piece of advice, the one thing that you would say to a new scholar or an early career scholar considering or writing an article for the first time. I don't know who wants to jump in with that one. I can go first. Um, please get feedback on your manuscript before you submit it. And this is a process I, as I have briefly outlined at the beginning of this webinar. And the more work that you do up front before you submit your article, the better off it will be and the higher your success rate will be in terms of getting published. And I'm happy to answer your questions anytime. I want you to succeed and I want to have your research published. That's excellent advice. Nan, Deborah, what do you think? Well, I think you might be on mute. Yeah, I, I, I want to follow on what Nan says about getting, about getting feedback. Um, my, my other piece of advice is take the time to write out a really good outline of the article. I know it sounds kind of um, trivial, or it sounds like the advice you got in, 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 in middle school or high school, but you, are, you, you, don't have, you don't have an unlimited number of pages for one thing, this can't be a hundred pages long. Uh, and, and you want to make sure that you cover clearly and logically um, the presentation of the significance of the research about how you did it, what the major findings are, um, your interpretation of them, and then to end with a conclusion um, and not let it just sort of drift away, which sometimes um, we see happen. And so even though during the course of writing, you may be revising it, I think having a roadmap um, will also help you a lot in putting that together. Hey, Christina, what do you think? Um, I think one of the things to keep in mind is that when you get the reviews back, and you read some critical 
you know, comments about your work and your work that you've spent maybe multiple years on, it can be really disheartening, but do not let that bother you. Be tenacious, keep going. The reviews are there to make you stronger, to make your work better and don't take it too much to heart. Just roll with it and just keep going and re, you know, revise and, and, and resubmit. And even if you get a rejection, rework the paper and submit it somewhere else. <laughs> I, love, I love that. That's, that's really excellent. Ken, what do you think? Um, I, I love what Christina's characterization. Back in the era of paper, I used to tell people, if you don't get a box in the mail with your paper crunched up in a ball, <laughs> you know, there's, there's hope you know, and, and you should look at the revisions. That crunch up, well, that's a, you know, maybe uh, that, that takes it a step beyond what you can do with it. But, you know, for me, it all comes down to, to uh, telling a story. And the fundamental thing I think every author needs to do is say, what is the purpose of the, of the paper? And then tell us why it's important because we all have different interests and some of us may not be as knowledgeable and iconography, mythology, religion, economics. So that's your area as author. Tell us why whatever you're doing, what it is and why it's important and what it contributes to the broader field you know, of Mesoamerican studies. And if you lead off with that and that's your, your, your primary objective, that will permeate the entire paper. You know, and, and it'll come out in the conclusions and it'll be a convincing argument you know, as to why it you know, should be accept it. So uh, I think boiling it down to that simple, you know, goal of, you know, what am I doing and why is it important? Educate, educate your reader. Everyone should save that scrunched up ball, shouldn't they? And then frame That's it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. You can make a collage and you can hang them from the ceiling. Absolutely. <laughs> Blanca, what do you think? Just to, just to close this question up. Yeah. Um, just to add up a little bit. Uh, responding to reader comments and, and reworking a paper can be an important learning exercise for any author. And invariably, um, we should uh, take into account that a well-reviewed paper end, ends up much stronger than, than it was when it started. So that's uh, an important thing. And um, uh, from the perspective of ancient Mesoamerica, it is great benefit to have a geographically expanding pool submitting authors and developing archaeological debates based on research and conceptual development from a wide range of contexts. And uh, this can only strengthen and elevate scholarship in the study of Mesoamerican archaeology. Wonderful. Um, we do have a few questions submitted by um, those who've joined us this evening, so I will um, kick in with those. Um, Marika Stoll, um, Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, Marika. Um, has submitted an article years ago um, and received it back as a resubmission with major revisions. Um, she writes that the demands of grad school has left a little time to now work on it and wondered whether to go back to the article and resubmit, but given the amount of time that's passed, would she need to start the process over? Um, I would definitely start the process over. Uh, perhaps there's been a lot of work in the interim that you need to include in your own article. I would not simply resubmit what you have already written. And this gives you a chance to revisit that original manuscript. I find that my most effective writing is when I, I write something and then I let it go for say a couple of weeks and then I come back and I look at it and I can clearly see that, oh, this is uh, not in logical order, or this could be bolstered here. So that is a, a good exercise for you to do in terms of revising it. And I look forward to seeing that manuscript. Great. Well, good luck with that, Marika. Um, Gavin has written and asked us whether there are any tips on obtaining permissions for reusing illustrations, particularly of monuments and what if the original publisher no longer exists? Does anyone have any experience around that? Yeah, I can speak to a few interesting examples that, that I've 
that I've had. Um, but what I will say, um, obviously, from the publisher's point of view, they want to make sure that copyright laws are respected. Um, but if you have made really multiple attempts to secure permission, um, and the publisher no longer exists, the author no longer exists, and you can document the efforts that you've made. I have found working with Cambridge University Press um, that they have been understanding that there are some things to which you cannot go back and get those um, original permissions. There is also the opportunity in some cases to redraw or redraft um, and, and modify the illustration um, that's pretty commonly done as, as a way of, of dealing with this, but do keep a track record when you start to seek permissions to document the fact that you have tried to, to, to work them. I wound up with some that someone had used in, a, in an article from um, archives in Spain, a photographs from the Spanish Civil War, and nobody was able to figure out who originally took the original photograph, nor were they able to actually completely document even where they were to be refound again in the archives. But we had a real documentation of our efforts, um, including writing to the archivists in Spain. And, and the journal accepted that as, as, as evidence of, of, of that effort. Thanks, Deborah. Um, Martin has written uh, and asked an interesting question around whether the journal accepts publications on objects that have no documented provenance or have come from the art market. Um, Blanca, Nan, can you, can you answer that one? Yeah, well, that basically depends on how the paper is developed, not, um, if it's based on, a, on an object, how, how well argumented the, 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 how well justified um, the purpose of the, the paper is. It's um, the focus of um, the um, review will be on the, the, the development of the paper, not on the fact that it's based on, on, a, on an object that has no pro, uh, provenance uh, find. I don't know if you want to add up, um, Nan. There are numerous objects, obviously, that do not have a provenience. Um, in general, I try to adhere to the ethics of the SAA in terms of publication on objects. Okay, thank you, Nan. Um, then Billy has asked us a question that we, we've sort of talked about a little bit before around examples of good titles and any any ones that you can remember that have been particularly clever and have really stood out in in, in um, terms of the words they used not simply you know kind of uh, titles that were concise or spoke to the content but really clever ones maybe funny ones or anything like that that really sort of springs to mind maybe there aren't any examples that you can think of but well i have um the issue here, I'm looking at this, and this is the, contains the special section on borders, which Christina and Carolyn Freiwald coordinated. And there are some intriguing titles here. Um, the Porous Boundary, for example, comparing late post-classic early colonial Maya projectile technologies across Peten and Belize. Now, if you just had Comparing late post-classic early colonial Maya projectile technologies across Peten and Belize, that doesn't sound as nearly intriguing as starting it with the porous boundary. What is the porous boundary? What is meant by that? So you can have, uh, and most of us archeologists like to have uh, titles that are actually two titles in one. For some reason we do this. We all do this, okay? But that's an example where you start off the title with something pithy, and then you go on to, with the rest of the title, uh, putting in those catch words that, that a search engine will pick up. Is it something that you spent um, um, a good amount of time on, Christina, or is it, 
that it's you know did, did your title just come to you in a sort of oh I'm the worst at titles I'm right? not a good person to ask <laughs> but but we do all like to be clever <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so with just a few more minutes of the webinar left this evening um, and before we close, I wondered if um, you'd all like to take um, a moment or so to, to just address the attendees maybe one more time with any final comments that you might have, um, anything that you'd like to say on any of the points we've talked about this evening um, or anything else that you'd like to add. So uh, Kenneth, do you, would you like to start? Um. Just an observation about uh, scholarship, uh, you know, that I find useful. Uh, and so I would encourage, uh, you know, authors to be useful for me, you know, when I'm reading their, their works. And that's when I find an, an intriguing idea or um, that's then argued and supported by data uh, from an author. What I really don't like to see is people citing a whole book, you know, I mean, Come on, you know, am I going to read through 500 pages to find the data to support an argument? Uh, I think better scholarship is one in which you, you know, you cite the page number so that uh, for somebody who's interested, who wants to follow up, uh, they can consult the work directly, especially if they don't believe it. But it, it shows more than anything that, uh, you know, when in writing the article, it provides the impression that you have really done your homework and you really understand the material. And sometimes that very subtle uh, uh, indication uh, is useful to convince reviewers uh, as well as your readers. So I think, you know, for me, I, I like to follow things up. Uh, and so I think that is a useful, uh, something for authors to consider doing, you know, put in the page numbers. Don't just cite whole words. Article is different, but when you're dealing with books, you know, it's a, uh, you'd be a little bit more specific. Sure. Deborah, what would you like to add? I wanted to follow up on Ken's um, uh, crumpled up ball. And, and that is in, in the peer review process, none of us likes to get criticism. We all think we got it perfectly right the first time. So what I've often done is I read them um, and, and you go for the, ooh, okay, all, all right, um, sting it, put it away for a day, take it out. And then I ask myself the question, how reading these reviewers comments can make what I've written better. Even if I don't agree with them, the point is, if, if they didn't understand what I said, then I need to rewrite it. Um, if, they, if they want me to write a different article, then I need to explain why this article is the one that I think is important to write. And they can write their other article. Um, but to, to, to sort of just take a deep breath, dive into it um, fresh in the morning, and, and ask yourself, how does what I'm hearing make it better? Christina? Um, just to circle back to the theoretical uh, discussion, I'd just like to say that Ancient Mesoamerica provides a nice balance of rigorous data and theory and conceptual advancement. So the two together are really married quite well. And so when you're in the process of writing your article, keep those two aspects in mind and both are important. Wonderful. Blanca, what would you, um, what would you say to, to kind of wrap up your comments this evening? Sure. Um, well, it's been mentioned before, but I think it, it's worth worth uh, emphasizing it. Have your paper read by peers before submission. As an author, sometimes you become blind to specific and obvious errors. So it's better if you have uh, more than one view on the paper before you, you submit it. Yeah, so true. And then final word this evening to, to you, Nan. Um, what would you like to say to you to kind of wind our webinar up this evening? Well, thank you all panelists and Christian for moderating and especially to our participants with the good questions. I appreciate your attention and please don't be intimidated by this publication process or reaching out to one of us. I know that when I started uh, in the field of archaeology, I was very intimidated and it's a, it's a big deal to contact someone you don't know. But please uh, feel free to contact me. I want to be accessible and I welcome your input and I look forward to having some exciting new manuscripts coming our way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nan. Um, and Christina, Deborah, Blanca, Kenneth, again, thank you from Cambridge. 
um, for your participation this evening.